Uh, interestingly, that Joseph uh, Fawcett that I was telling you about, Joe Fawcett had a great grandson by the name of William Monroe Trotter, uh, who founded uh, with uh, W.E.B. Du Bois the Niagara Movement. Uh, he was an activist himself, uh, very, very well educated man. Um, and uh, all of the families, the, Grain, the, the Hughes family, the, uh, the Fawcett family, uh, the Hemings family, all took on uh, responsibilities that were in many ways uh, uh, civic responsibilities. Frederick Madison Roberts, uh, that you'll see on this end, was the first African-American legislator um, uh, in uh, uh, California. Uh, and you will see uh, also uh, that the descendants of Sally Hemings and of Eston and Madison uh, fought in the Civil War. So that continuation of family, the continuation of faith. Peter Fawcett became a minister, uh, and it was Peter who said uh, this. My parents were here in Ohio. I wanted to be with them and be free, so I resolved to get free or die in the attempt. Uh, Peter ran away several times um, and was recaptured. And finally, with the help of his family, he was, his freedom was bought and he finally arrived, uh, finally rejoined his family in Ohio. I thought this was one of the best museum exhibits that I'd ever seen, and I was particularly impressed because it's really sensitive. Plus, it's the Smithsonian Museum of American History. It's on the mall, it's at the, you know, it's, it's you know, yards from the White House and a stone's throw from the Congress building, and there's the sense like this is the well, I mean, this is the official, you know, this is the official history. I mean, it, it has this sort of, you know, weight based on where it is and the fact that it's the Smithsonian. What struck me was, I was wondering if this means like how far we've come as a society because do you think 50 years ago you could have had that exhibit like no. it is? No, I mean, and that's something that they didn't talk about, but I love the way that you're thinking kind of, you know, in terms of this as a source. I mean, if you went back 50 years ago, Totally different. I like the human touch to it because they're much more complicated and mm -hmm. they have to deal with their times. And we know a great deal about a small number of the enslaved at Monticello. I told you there were over 600. I've introduced you to maybe 30 or 40 that we know a great deal about. Don't you dare leave thinking that those other 500 are not important as well. The fact that we have their names is uh, a testament to uh, Jefferson's record keeping and also to the history uh, and the historians who have made this all happen. But if you asked me why I would say that Jefferson was anomalous and that he was not a normal, <coughs> Jefferson said that he did not want, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said he wanted his uh, enslaved population to respect him. He did not want them to fear him. He tried to keep the families together. He discouraged abroad marriages. He tried to get them to marry on the, on the mountain so that the, the family was together there. Uh, and so all of that is what makes me uh, uh, suggest that as a, as, a, as a slave owner, now I don't think that there is such a thing as a good slave owner, especially someone like Jefferson when you think of the fact that he was governor of Virginia, when you think of the fact that he was a two-term president, when you think of the fact that he was secretary of state, a he had a variety of opportunities to do something significant about the institution of slavery. He never did. And so there is that reality to him, but there's also the other reality. And I think the public Jefferson and the private Jefferson are two different Jeffersons altogether. In order to see Jefferson clearly, you have to see him through the lens of its enslaved community as well.